Okay, guys, um, if everyone could take a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashley Kivette, and I am the Chapter Vice President of Young Americans for Liberty at the University of Texas at Austin. I am honored to introduce our next speaker tonight. He is known worldwide as one of the foremost leaders of the libertarian movement, and his 2008 presidential campaign is the reason Young Americans for Liberty exists today. He is a Pennsylvania native, a graduate of Gettysburg College, and a graduate of Duke Medical School. He was a doctor in both the United States Air Force and National Guard, and set up a successful OBGYN practice in Lake Jackson, Texas, where he is credited with delivering more than 4,000 babies. He began his lifelong interest in Austrian economics, libertarianism, and non-interventionism in medical school. He has served as member of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1976, 1979 through 1985, and 1997 through 2013, where he won a reputation as the entirely principled member of the House, as well as an expert in economics, history, and political philosophy. He ran for president in 1988 as a libertarian, and again in 2008 and 2012 as a Republican, each time gaining nationwide support for the ideas of freedom, peace, and prosperity. He is the president of the Free Foundation, president of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, chairman of the Campaign for Liberty, and distinguished counselor to the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He has over one million followers on Facebook and over 400,000 on Twitter. My fellow Young Americans for Liberty, it's happening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Ashley, thank you for that nice introduction. And uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Frazee and uh, Bumper Hornberger for the invitation. Two of my favorite organizations, the Future Freedom Foundation and Young Americans for Liberty, great organizations. If you had them, haven't heard of about them before, you should remember them because they are doing great work for the cause of liberty. It's also an honor to be on a panel and a panel of speakers with two very important speakers that you've heard already, and, and that's uh, Radley and uh, Glenn, and um, they are certainly friends of liberty. But, uh, you know, I want to challenge uh, Jeff or Bumper about the uh, title, uh, Stop the Wars on Drugs and Terrorism. And, you know, some people think you should cut the words down to make them as small as possible to get a point across. So I would suggest our job is stop the war on liberty. That is the problem. <laughs> So if we could stop the war on liberty, we certainly would stop the war on drugs, we would stop the war on terrorism, we'd stop the war overseas, and we'd stop the wars in a lot of different places. But that's what we're suffering from, is the uh, war on liberty, which has been ongoing uh, for, for a long time. Certainly in the last 100 years, it's been a very, very deliberate war against liberty. And there are some days where I think that, uh, that is mostly when I'm in Washington, I think we're totally losing. But when I come out and meet more people, meet groups like this, and go to the college campuses, I get enthusiastic because I do believe that there is a future for freedom and we are winning the war for liberty. Most people think of war for the wars that have been going on here for certainly the last uh, 15 years. I, I date the uh, current set of wars starting in 1990 and pursuing got much worse after 9-11. But uh, the American people know about it uh, when they see soldiers coming back and soldiers not coming back and the persistent costs. But it is different now because they have the, the, our government made up of mostly Republicans and Democrats, and they have had this declaration of war against terrorism, and all it is is an excuse. It's, it's an official war 
When war has been declared, it is assumed that the people will be complacent, they will be patriotic, and they will go along and accept the attack on liberty under those conditions. It is that psychological viewpoint that we have to change because we're not really at war in the true sense of the word, and we should never allow them the assumption that this fictitious need for this war is an excuse for attacking our civil liberties. Certainly, 9-11 had a lot to do with our current events, and all of us remember that day uh, very well. And I remember the week following it, how quickly, how quickly they had a bill come to the floor, uh, the, the Patriot Act. What an evil name for an evil bill. I would say that's the most unpatriotic bill that we have done in this country in a long, long time. You know, the amazing thing was the bill was already written. It had been around for a long time. And, uh, but they sort of brought it to the floor rather quickly. Uh, no significant hearings in the committees. And it popped up on the floor the night before it was going to be, on, uh, uh, be, be voted on in the House. And it was being rushed through. And, of course, uh, it was uh, passed overwhelmingly. And I remember very clearly sitting next to another member of Congress and uh, I was one of the small number of people, and guess what? I voted against that bill for sure. <laughs> but I uh, looked at the uh, member next to me, and he was a nice guy, and he basically was conservative and didn't like big government. So, and he voted for it, of course. And I said, "Why are you voting for this?" And uh, he says, well, um, he says, uh, it's the Patriot Act. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff in there. We haven't even had a chance to read it. He says, I know, I know. But he said, you know, how am I going to go back after 9-11 and tell my people back at home that I voted against the Patriot Act under these conditions? And I said, I don't know how you do it, but you ought to. You know there's bad stuff in there, and that's your job to go back and explain your vote. The one thing about perpetual war is the way we pay for the wars, because they are costly. They're costly in so many ways. They're costly in the loss of our civil liberties, and they, uh, th that is perpetual. It's constant. They use it as an excuse. And this is the reason that uh, government follows the old adage, uh, especially our government now, uh, that uh, truth is treason in an empire of lies. And I think our former speaker, especially Glenn, knows exactly what I'm talking about because you take an individual who should be heralded as a great hero, he's now by our government saying, well, he's treasonous and he's not even allowed to come back to his country. So I would say that attitude is the wrong attitude. Governments should be open, our privacy should be protected, and we should have the protection of our government and we should expose them when they are the ones that are concealing the truth and exposing lies. We have it turned upside down. We defend the privacy of the government at the same time we don't do anything about the, we protect the secrecy of our government, we don't do anything to protect the privacy of the individuals. And I understand there was a couple phrases in the Constitution that said it should be the other way around. Well, there's a monetary cost to this perpetual war when we lose our liberties, uh, but the monetary cost is huge. But it's, it's hidden. It, I, I would think if you had one rule change, which has uh, never been applied to, that is, if a country goes to war, they ought to pay for it. You know, maybe all of a sudden, oh, we can't afford that war. But can you imagine in the last 15 years if the American taxpayers said, oh, yeah, we're all for this war. we got to go get the bad guys. If we had to pay for it, of course, uh, they wouldn't vote for it. So the cost is hor horrendous. But, it, but it's been around. It certainly occurred uh, since Woodrow Wilson's day on, especially since 1913. They have a way of getting around it. They, yes, they can use the income tax and taxes plenty, but they never have enough. 
enough. They can borrow, and they can borrow plenty, but there's a limit to that, or interest rates will go up. So what do they have? They have this little gimmick invented by a bunch of Keynesian economists who said, well, when a government is, does too much, they have to keep spending, so therefore we'll print the money and everybody will be happy. That is one of the reasons why I think that not only should we have an audit of the Fed bill, but we should look at getting rid of the Federal Reserve as well. <laughs> but there is there's tremendous costs that lingered, and there have been statistics about, put out about our veterans that are suffering right now. It's not hundreds of billions of dollars. They're talking about trillions of dollars, and nobody knows how long this is going to last. And one thing I know is that the system, our system, our financial system, will not last to pay those bills. And they will not last to pay all the entitlements and all the, all the commitments that are made by this government. So there will be a change, and one of the principal causes of this is the expense of, of war. And we, we have to uh, be realistic about this and uh, realize how serious it is. When you look at what the veterans are going through today, it's, it's really tragic. And I had to face up to this during some of the debates where this whole issue uh, came up. And, and, and it truly did break my heart at times to think about how wildly supportive the country has been uh, for the war. And all you have to do is just look around and open your eyes and see the tragedies. All you have to do is look at the statistics and show that because of the insanity of this war and the irrash irrationality of this war, that we have soldiers whose minds have been twisted and injured, that we lose 22 soldiers, veterans a day, committing suicide, and it doesn't seem like anybody cares. You know, it wasn't too long ago that I got on an airplane and it, I could just see one gentleman sitting in the front row, and he was a tall guy, blonde guy, and it looked like he could have been the top basketball player in any college team. And then afterwards he got up and he had to have some help because he had only one limb. Nobody could get his suitcase down, and you know that he was hit by an IED. And yet we seemed to go this by, pass this by, and when this subject would come up in a the debate, they say, well, we have to go in more, send more troops. We can't allow these individuals to have died in vain. Well, if they died in vain, how can you change it by killing more in vain? The real problem economics is not only the cost to, to all the taxpayers and to our economy, but it does drain out the wealth of the country. Wars are very costly. And you say, well, it doesn't. They're not going to tax us. They're not going to borrow. They're just going to print it, and it's going to be okay. But guess what? The idea of just printing money out of thin air is very, very costly, but only to one group of people that really suffer the consequences. And it happens to be that group of people are rather large in number, and that is the middle class. Have you looked at the statistics that we have with us today? The middle class is shrinking. The number of people in unemployment, the working force, is smaller than it's been in decades because of the distortion in the economy. Real wealth has drained. And then we have our economic system all, uh, all messed up with high taxes and regulations that much of the money and investments go overseas. And it, it's, it's a real mess, and this country is getting much much, much poorer, but there's a certain group that just happens to be getting a lot richer, and they happen to be in the very rich class, and uh, this uh, is not, should not be a surprise to anyone. If anybody understands Austrian economics and the monetary policy of Keynesianism, where you he, he print money and inflate the currency, Mises many, many years ago had explained that there will be a transfer of wealth. The transfer of wealth goes from the middle class and the poor. Uh, sometimes the poor manages to hang on because they're on the receiving end as well. But the large productive middle class suffer the consequence and the wealth is transferred to those who get to use the money first. And who gets to use it first? Well, there are bankers. They get to use it. 
politicians get to use it, and uh, governments get to use it to perpetuate, you know, jobs that are totally unnecessary. So uh, people have th this, this money gravitates into this system, and lo and behold, you know, just a few bucks gets into the hands of the military industrial complex. Did you ever realize that? That ought to stop. They ought to pay the bills and they shouldn't be on the gravy train by fighting undeclared, unnecessary wars that ought to be stopped and not allow war profiteers to benefit from it. So often I think of the, the war as being an attack on our liberty, and Randolph Bourne said, war is the health of the state, and it truly is. Have war, and the people just seem to roll over. It was so discouraging to me that several weeks, and but it continues to some degree, after 9-11, because uh, people would come to me, and they were very sincere. They knew I was earnest about it and sincere in my beliefs that we shouldn't, you know, be doing some of these things and attacking our liberties. And uh, they would say, Ron, it's okay. I understand what you did, but not under these conditions because, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you have to give up part of your liberties when you're under attack. It was normal and natural. I would say, especially when you're under attack, you don't want to give up your liberties. It was said that they came here to attack us because we were free and prosperous. Well, pretty soon, maybe they'll lose the incentive because we're losing our freedom and we're losing our prosperity. Maybe they'll quit. Today we have a foreign policy that uh, I like to describe as schizophrenic. Uh, that's a rather strong term, but it doesn't make any sense. It's like nutty people are running it. You know, here we have, we spend a lot of money, we send weapons over supposedly to defend our interests, defend our liberty, and defend our Constitution. This whole idea that we're over there to defend our Constitution is a bit nutty, but it really goes bad when we start sending weapons and troop and training people, and it helps our enemies and creates more enemies than it helps. So we have in some parts of the Middle East now, we're on the side of the Iranians. In other parts, we're against them. And uh, right now, we're trying to negotiate a, a treaty, and not a treaty, but just some talk, and at least some diplomacy with the Iranians. So it's all mixed up. You know, one thing about this talk uh, going on with Obama's administration and the Iranians is that, um, you know, I'm very sympathetic with it, obviously. I'm, I've always advocated talk to people. You know, I, I not only want to talk with the Cubans, I want to trade with the Cubans. I want you to be able to go to Cuba if you want, and you shouldn't be denied that right. <laughs> Richard, Richard Nixon was not the ideal of a president, and he ran into some problems. Actually, they're rather <laughs> mediocre compared to some of the modern-day presidents on what they have done. but. When Nixon went and made that effort to talk to the Chinese, uh, it turned out to be a great moment, the greatest moment of his uh, political career. Because I remember very clearly in high school, uh, the, uh, the uh, Korean War broke out. I remember World War I and World War II, not one. <laughs> but World War II, but I remember all about it and the evils that came out of it and what Woodrow Wilson did and what the Versailles Treaty did. But World War uh, II uh, was over and everybody was happy. But here, just a few years later, in the early 50s, uh, here goes another war in Korea. Uh, did the Congress declare the war? Oh, no, we live in the modern age. This is a UN police operation. And, uh, of course, tens of thousands of Americans uh, uh, were, were, were killed. And uh, yet, finally, after years and years and decades of fighting and, and, and fuming with the Chinese, we finally say, maybe we ought to talk to each other. And they were, they were not angels. They're still not angels. We're not angels. We ought to be able to talk to both, both people. So now, the odds of us breaking out, I hope I'm right on this, with the Chinese are slim to none. But it's because we trade with people. The founders were right about trade. You want friendship, you want friendship and trade. You want commerce with other countries, and you want honest friendship with countries, and you want to stay out of entangling alliances with all nations. <laughs> Thank you.
One argument about the, um, the debate going on uh, with, with the negotiations with Iran is, do we really need to? If we really live in a free society, do we really have this moral obligation and legal obligation that we should be very much involved in deciding what the Iranians can do or we shouldn't do for their national defense? I would lean in that direction. But also lean in the direction of saying when there is a problem and there should be at least con conversation, why shouldn't our president be allowed to do that as, uh, as, uh, as Obama's doing now with Cuba? I think that is fine. But there's also explicit authority in the Constitution for oversight. The president just can't go off and have any old agreement and the Congress roll over. So I think the Congress has a point, you know, that whatever you agree to, we want to review it. And, uh, but I strongly disagree with the motivation of that statement made by uh, so many members of Congress, uh, especially in the Senate. They have to review it. Do they want to review it? And it's all of a sudden they're constitutionalists. We have this constitutional responsibility to review these agreements. What a joke that is. That's not the reason. They're out to stop peace. They're terrified that peace might break out. So a change in our foreign policy could go a long way, and those couple points I made were made by Jefferson a few years ago. I don't remember him. He wasn't up in Washington. <laughs> but they're, they're good ideas, and uh, it, it really is the road to peaceful relationships. And I just do not believe for a minute that we have earned the privilege or the right and uh, the, the obligation uh, to make the world safe for democracy. We have spent too much blood, sweat, and tears. We have killed too many people. But you can say, but we've gotten some elections over there, haven't we? Yeah, and they last for a year or two, and we don't like the guy that got elected, so we just go after him to get rid of him. So I would say that if uh, the, democratic, the idea of a democratic election ever spreads, it has to be spontaneous. Now, I believe in, in uh, uh, American uh, setting an example. Uh, I don't think we're we should spread our exceptionalism at the point of a gun, but just think of what it could be like if we had advanced the cause of liberty instead of setting it back from what was started in, uh, it, with our revolution. If we could have continued to advance it, what if we'd have had true free markets and sound money and property rights, no asset forfeiture, no IRS agents, no NSA, nobody spying on us, and set an example for the world? Uh, maybe somebody would want to emulate us. That is the only way it'll work. The wonderful thing for me about the solution for the problems we have, it can be found in emphasizing liberty. Stop the war on liberty, get people to understand what true liberty is all about, emphasize it and move it in that direction. And this is where I become much more optimistic. I believe, <clears throat> I believe very sincerely that uh, many people, especially in the young group, are waking up to this and they realize what they're inheriting, a bad economic system, a silly, foolish foreign policy, and an attack on civil liberties that we ought to ad address. And they're waking up. But just think of what Jeff Frazee has done with Young Americans for Liberty. Hundreds and hundreds of chapters around the country, much bigger than Young Americans for Freedom once was, which was not true liberty even then. But now we have a group spreading this message around on campuses to the tune of thousands and thousands of people. That's where the answers are going to be found. You know, before, before the Depression, there was only talk about free markets and sound money and, and uh, staying out of war. You know, both <clears throat> Wilson and uh, even Roosevelt keep us out of war, uh, this sort of thing. And uh, yet, in our universities in the 20s, you had plenty of people who were reading and discussing fascism and communism and socialism, and it was infiltrating into our system. And the Depression comes along, and they won out. They won the intellectual fight. But behind the scenes, the seeds were planted. And uh, I don't believe things happen accidentally. I think they happen 
ideological reasons. And if the ideology is correct, eventually things will change. And that is what I believe is the only way you can bring about changes. In spite of the fact that I spent a year or two in Washington in politics, the poli pure political answer is not available to us. That is not the answer. We have to change the hearts and minds of people. We have to do it for a whole generation to believe and have confidence in what liberty is all about. Why? If you truly desire peace and prosperity, you have to look at this message about what individual liberty is all about. A lot of people think that uh, liberty is uh, given to us by our Constitution and the government takes care of us and this sort of thing. But to me, it comes in a natural way. For many of us, it comes in a God-given way. And it doesn't come in groups. You don't have your liberty because you belong to some group or some age group or some color or some sex or whatever. You have liberty because you're an individual and no questions should be asked. And everybody should be treated exactly the same. And when they're mistreated, which we have done in this country plenty of times, you know, when, when we look at, look at our history, but the answer cannot be a, a collective uh, demand and say, well, I belong to this group and I was discriminated back there. And now you have to give me special benefits. Uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. It's an individual thing. You have to have due process of law. And in many ways, our justice is not colorblind. There's too many ands, if, and buts, and, and we don't see the results. But this, this would go a long way to solving our problems if we could have this understanding. Uh, but I think the founders had a pretty good idea about that. But I think it's been... Uh, uh, we, we've been losing it. Uh, we have a 9-11 and people say, well, you got to give up your, uh, your liberties to be safe. The government has to take over. Oh, we had a Great Depression, so maybe these free, ma free market people and the gold standard people are absolutely wrong. That's why we have to have somebody redistributing the wealth. Well, yeah, it lasts for a while. There's a lot of wealth to consume. But what we're facing today is the end, st end stages of the consumption of the wealth that we have and destruction of the productive capacity of this country. And so therefore, it will not be easy. But I'll tell you one thing that I believe with certainty, and that is if and when the economic crisis hits, if all our wealth was eliminated overnight, but we retained our liberty, and we had a government that protected our liberty and did nothing else, did not confiscate, did not force us to do things that we don't want, did not become the policeman, did not tell us what to do in our social life, did not tell us what to do in our religious life, did not tell us what to do in our economic life and how we spend our dollars. I believe that within a short period of time, we'd be back on our feet again. You know, it, it was um, frequently came up in the campaign that, uh, well, everybody has to sacrifice in order to get things in shape again. Things are in trouble. Now you have to sacrifice, and you have to sacrifice to get this thing going. I said, where'd you get this idea that you have to sacrifice? If I get rid of the IRS and get rid of your taxes and get rid of the heavy hand of government, and they're not going to tell you what to do, what are you sacrificing? The only people who, who need to sacrifice are the ones who are living off the government, who are benefiting from the contracts from government and the benefits of the monetary system. Yes, they should be set back, but an individual willing to work does not have to sacrifice anything. All he wants is his liberty. The uh, basic principles of a free society are not complicated. Matter of fact, most people in the world in many ways accept it. Most major religions have always accepted it. And that is you don't steal from people and you don't kill people. Love is a good idea. And uh, yet, uh, at, at the same time, uh, we know that as individuals, we know that no matter what our condition is, that if we uh, don't have a car, and we don't have a job, and we don't have medical care, 
We're entitled to it. Other people have it. We're entitled to it, so the government has to give it to me. I don't know where they get it, but they're magicians. And they're, they're going to give me my job. They're going to give me my medical care and then my education. And uh, they, they will just be, be able to take care of me completely and, and, and totally. But uh, the whole problem with that is somebody, somebody eventually has to, has to pay for this, and they don't realize that, and it's the, it's the payment. But, you know, the old Bastiat principle, I think, is so sound. And it's so clear, clear cut. And Bastiat simply says that uh, if you and I can't do it, and most religions recognize that we can't take it, uh, you know, from somebody else just because we need it. Need is not a right. Entitlement, because it's called an entitlement, doesn't make it a, a right. But all of a sudden, what you're not allowed to do the politician is rewarded handsomely for doing it. The politician's rewarded. The bureaucrats are rewarded. The policing agents are rewarded. The military is rewarded. The banksters are rewarded. See, that's where the problem is. <clears throat> Governments should never be able to do anything that you're not allowed to do. What about... What about the FBI and other police activities where they uh, set up these sting operations and entice and talk to some people who are sort of vulnerable people, talk them into doing something that is technically illegal, and all of a sudden a crime can be stopped and somebody gets congratulated. I don't think, you know, if we did that as an individual, we'd be in big trouble. So governments should never be able to break the law in order to try to trap somebody and trap somebody and then punish them for their benefit. So that principle, along with the elimination of asset forfeiture, might put some restraints on our policing activities. Yeah. You know... Uh, the whole idea of uh, restraining people is something that, that should be done, but the big question is how to do it. Now, uh, things are a mess now. Uh, Radley has done such great work on the uh, uh, work on the uh, militarization of the of the police, and uh, but I saw something the other night, and uh, Radley, you have to deal with this and make sure they don't do this because. Uh, uh, Al Sharpton had a solution for us. Al, Al Sharpton said, those police are lousy, lousy bums and we got to do something about it. We have to totally nationalize the police force. <laughs> yeah, so you can see if there's a bad police department, uh, and I'm sure we don't have 100% bad policemen, but you have some bad ones, you want to put them in charge because you know how the, the worst uh, rise to the top. So, uh, but it's also prohibited. It was never intended under the Constitution. We have way too much policing activities from Washington, uh, D.C. And I think we need more policing of the government. That's what we need. We don't need policing of the people. I would say we should apply the anti-laws uh, uh, anti against uh, uh, counterfeiting. You know, they're pretty strict about counterfeiting. Uh, the founders thought you should get the death penalty for counterfeiting. But you know who the biggest counterfeiters now are, and that, of course, is the Federal Reserve. But I'm not advocating. I don't believe in the death penalty, so I'm not quite ready for that. <laughs> I know you'll disagree with me on that. <laughs> So, but, but uh, we do have to look at, at the Constitution, but we have to look at this more morally on what is right and what's wrong and what can work. And uh, this whole idea of owning property, I think, is so important. I think all civil liberties can be defined through property. So property uh, is a protection. So if you happen to be a religious person, it's that piece of property that protects you. If you happen to have a newspaper, that property protects you. And uh, I think that individuals and property could solve all the problems of, of the, uh, uh, that we run into on the violation of civil liberties. The other thing about the uh, uh, understanding of liberty is I am convinced that if people would get together and understand this, that there would be a coming together. Why? Because they will practice their freedoms the way I do? No. 
I have my freedom, and I can apply my social values to whatever I want to do as long as I follow the rule, I don't force anybody else to do it, and I don't hurt anybody in doing it. But why, why wouldn't that be so wonderful if you had, and it is true, uh, it's been mentioned quite a few times that, you know, these ideas do bring diversity together. People, uh, I noticed that uh, very frequently during the campaign, we had bi very, very diverse audiences, and it always uh, cheered me up because I said, use your freedom. The only thing is you can't use force, but if you use, use your freedom in a way that hurts you, don't come to me and blame me and make me pay for your mistakes. And the other thing, for some, uh, one group in, in politics that have trouble with this is they say, you mean all, all relationships should be voluntary as long as there's no force and injury? Yeah, that's right. Well, you couldn't have that in economics, could you? That would be unfair. How could you get fair distribution? So they don't want it in economics. They want it in social things. But no, voluntary associations have to be across the board, social and uh, also uh, ec economic. But people, people the, the liberal argues, well, there's always going to be people suffering. Who wants to see anybody suffering? And that is the reason I'm for the free market and sound money and get the government off our backs because the evidence is overwhelming that the most prosperous nations in the history of the world have always been the ones that had the maximum amount of freedom. And on the other side, uh, the one side can't tolerate, uh, you know, uh, some people who make money and therefore they want to have more fairness even though uh, they're making a mistake. But what, what, about, uh, what about the others that don't like the personal habits of people? They say, well, he does this and this and that's immoral and all that. But if, if in, in many ways to accept this philosophy, you have to have a bit of tolerance within you to say that, yes, I have my right to my life I can set my own standards, but I do not have the moral authority, nor should I ever have the legal authority to try to tell other people how to live or what church they should go to. It is that tolerance that so often we lack. You know, in, in Washington, it's frequently uh, uh, said that uh, there's a mess up there. Uh, government is locked down. They don't get along together. The truth is the opposite. They get along way too well together because they have these uh, omnibus bills at the end of the year, and about 20 people get together, and they decide how the money's going to be spent and who gets what. So, uh, yes, on the big stuff, they agree. They agree on the Federal Reserve. They agree on the IRS. They agree on taxation. They agree on Keynesian economics. And tragically, they agree on war. And uh, so it's too much bipartisanship. When the liberty movement really makes grounds, people, the other day I was on a radio program and the host said, well, Ronnie, he says, do you, think, uh, do you think that the best thing for Republicans who believe in the freedom movement should get out of the party and go elsewhere to promote this? And I said, well, I don't even see it that way. Uh, just like I indicated that in, uh, in the Depression, uh, the, the, um, uh, pe the college people, the, um, the professors had taught all this baloney of Keynesian economics. So Republicans and Democrats, everybody endorsed it. The schools endorsed it and the media endorsed it and all. So if you have a true revolution, it's not going to be a Republican revolution. As a matter of fact, they have some serious problems. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, you, you, have to, um, uh, you, you have to get it to be across the board. If people want to believe in liberty, understand civil liberties, understand the issues of war, understand the issues of money, then it has to be bipartisan, not bipartisan. It has to be uh, nonpartisan. It has to include everybody. It has to include both parties. And, and now the biggest party are the independents, and they, they should. But we have to get their attention, and that is what's going on. 
And that's where I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by what I hear and see around the campuses. And, uh, and, and it's something dramatically different than even what it was when I first went to Congress, which was in 1976. I didn't stay all that time. I went back to medicine, didn't have much desire to be in politics. But believe me, there is a big difference now. And I think there's a reason, because we're all understanding that we're facing the end of an era, an end of a major era of a test which essentially has been well over 100 years testing big government, endless wars, uh, and, and lack of uh, respect for national uh, sovereignty and independence. And the economy is in worse shape than anybody wants to admit. And this thing is going to fall apart, as far as I'm concerned. And there has to be something to fill the void. And this is the job of those who get concerned and those of you who are interested. You have a responsibility to do something about it for your own sake, for your family's sake, for everybody's sake, to find something to do. A lot of people who after, after I give a talk will come up and say, Ron, I agree with you. Tell me what I should do. And I tell them, do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. Maybe I told Jeff that one time, and look at what he's done. You know, that is fantastic. And uh, so there's always a job out there. But foremost is to, let's say you agreed with a percentage of what I've said, and you disagree with somebody, you think, well, maybe that's true. Find out what you believe. Find out if, if you really believe that you can print money forever. And find out if you can have that much freedom in economic policy. Find out if property rights are that important. And find out, if, could we live in a safer world if we didn't fight wars? And, and make a decision. But once you know and understand this, then what you do is more or less up to you, and sometimes it's beyond your own control. If you're available and you understand it and, want, and you have a message to offer, believe me, somebody will find you, and you will be able to participate and it's vital that we all participate in this war for liberty. Thank you very much.